Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Michelle Stradowski. I'm the Chief Public Affairs Officer for the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a quick rundown on what's going to happen today, uh, and then we'll begin our program. Um, with me today is Sue McCormick, the CEO of the Great Lakes Water Authority, uh, Navid Mehram, the Chief Operating Officer for Wastewater Operating Services, and Suzanne Coffey, our Chief Planning Officer. Um, they, uh, Sue will speak and uh, Suzanne and Naveed will be in support to answer questions. Um, Sue, Suzanne and Naveed, if you would please say your name, spell your name and give your title, that would be helpful for us. Sue? Thank you, Michelle. It's Sue McCormick, M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K, and I am the CEO, Chief Executive Officer for the Great Lakes Water Authority. Suzanne? Suzanne Coffey, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-C-O-F-E-Y. I am Great Lakes Water Authority's Chief Planning Officer. Naveed? Naveed Maram, N-A-V-I-D-M-E-H-R-A-M. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Wastewater Operations for Great Lakes Water Authority. Thank you all. Um, next, we will. the first thing we will do is hear from Sue McCormick. She will give uh, an update on the uh, operations, uh, GLWA operations and system response to the June 25th, 26th flooding, uh, a rain event. Um, and then um, once Sue is complete, we will open it up for Q&A. I would ask um, if uh, those that are on the call, if you have not yet renamed uh, yourself to ensure that your name is there, uh, would you please do that? Um, for Q&A, we will uh, ask that you please raise your hand in the chat function and we will call on those that have raised their hand for questions. Um, you can also submit your question in the chat function if that's something you would like to do. Um, right now we are asking that reporters limit their questions to two per person to ensure that we have uh, enough time to answer everyone's questions. Uh, now I will um, turn it over to Sue. Sue? Uh, thank you, Michelle. Before I go into our detailed update, I want to acknowledge the significant impact this rain event has had on the lives of so many throughout our community. And I want to thank Governor Whitmer, our congressional delegation, and all of the local officials who have worked so hard to address the serious issues created by this rain event and for their work to bring FEMA to the table to provide financial assistance to those affected. I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of the GLWA team members who worked tirelessly throughout this rain event and throughout the entire year to maintain our operations. I'm going to go through my remarks in sections in order to make the details as clear as possible. I'm going to try to do that with a cadence that will allow you to take some notes so that you can answer questions. I'm gonna start with a brief recap of the rain event itself and then give some background on critical operational elements of the regional collection system and then outline our response. First background on the rain event. As you all know, on Friday, June 25th, and continuing into Saturday, June 26th, Southeast Michigan experienced an unprecedented rainfall event, delivering seven to 10 inches, well, seven to eight inches of rain over a period of less than 19 hours. And not only did we receive a large volume of precipitation, but it also fell in very intense bursts. That highest intensity was a three hour burst that occurred just before and after midnight. You should know that GLWA maintains a network of precipitation gauges within the city of Detroit, and a review of the gauge data indicated that the rain event was far beyond our design standard. We're held to a design standard of conveying a 10-year, one-hour storm. That translates to an event that would statistically occur once every 10 years. Many gauges registered rain intensities beyond a 100-year event, and three gauges in the city registered a 1,000 year event. This translates to an intensity that was statistically predicted to occur one time every 1,000 years. In plainer terms, the flooding was caused by the amount and the intensity of the rain, which was more than what typically falls in the entire month of June, and it overwhelmed the system. It was not caused by any single pumping station or any single element within the regional system the Connor Creek pump station did not fail. That's a message that's out there and I wanna be clear about that and we'll walk through the details of how exactly that station did operate. The current system functioned at its capacity in the circumstances that we had. 
Now I wanna give you some background on the regional systems wastewater pump stations. Wastewater pump stations lift wastewater and when necessary, excess stormwater to the water resource recovery facility for processing and treatment. Most of the wastewater collection system is gravity fed, but in low lying areas, pump stations are necessary to lift the wastewater to higher elevations to then flow by gravity to downstream infrastructure. There are five sewage pump stations in the regional wastewater collection system and four within Detroit's local system. GLWA operates all nine of these pump stations. You know, widespread flooding occurred throughout Southeast Michigan, um, but despite that, specific attention has focused on the Connor Creek and the fruit pump stations, and I wanna speak directly to those. In large wet weather events, these two pump stations work together to convey flow from Detroit's east side, Gross Point Park, Gross Point Farms, Gross Point, and the Southeast Michigan Sanitary District. That's where I'm gonna focus my operational update. First talking about Frood and then Connor Creek. The Frood pump station consists of a pump house, a wet well, and a transformer enclosure. All wastewater flow to the Frood pump station is combined sanitary sewage. However, through the complex sewer network that is operated for the east side wastewater collection system, the Frood station provides redundancy through overflow structures for the Connors Creek pump station as well. During normal dry weather flow, the facility is in standby. During wet weather, six 3000 horsepower, very large storm pumps, 290 million gallons a day each discharge combined wastewater to the Connor Creek CSO. Connor Creek pump station is required because the elevation of the system's relief sewers is too low to allow the sewage to continue to flow by gravity for treatment. During normal dry weather flow, wastewater is discharged to the Detroit River Interceptor, the DRI. During wet weather, the wastewater is discharged to the Connor Creek CSO. This pump station consists of a sanitary pump house, a stormwater pump house, a switch house, and backwater gates. During normal dry weather flow, Wastewater is discharged from the Connors Creek pump station by four sanitary pumps, each of 71 million gallons a day, one 48 million gallon a day pump and one 38 million gallon a day pump to the DRI. During wet weather, six stormwater pumps with very large horsepower ratings, 2,225 to 2,300 horsepower, 318 million gallons a day each, discharge combined wastewater to the Connor Creek CSO. These stormwater pumps are in addition to the four sanitary pumps. That gives you background on the facilities and I wanna talk about the operations that occurred during the rain event itself. I'm gonna start it through. Moving into some technical details, I will reference levels of the wastewater in the pump stations. Know that 100 feet of elevation is approximately ground level at these pump stations. For example, when I say 64 feet, that's 36 feet below the ground. As flow in the rain event began to enter the fruit pump station, one pump was placed in service online at approximately 4.54 p.m. on Friday. That's when the wet well level reached 64 feet. It should be noted that 64 feet is the minimum level required to start a pump. You can't do that in advance. You have to have head available to the pump. At 5.07, GLWA Systems Control Center attempted to start a second pump. However, it experienced several trips as the start attempt was being made. System to control was able to successfully energize the second pump after several attempts while maintaining wet well levels at approximately 64 feet, well, well below grade. No issues uh, would be associated with that. By 7.52 p.m., the flows in the wet well had receded to 40 feet and the pump station returned to standby status. This is a part of that situation where the storm had its bursts. Shortly thereafter, the wet well level began to rise above 64 feet, which then triggered a pump to start. System control successfully energized one pump by 920 and the second pump by 925. These two pumps were able to sustain the wet well levels at approximately 70 feet, still 30 feet below ground level. Again, systems control anticipating increased flows attempted to start a third pump. The third pump failed to initially start. 
and on one occasion de-energized the first and the second pumps that only lasted for two minutes. That brief de-energization did not impact the wet well levels. Systems Control was able to energize the third pump by 2.21 a.m. Although the pump station has six pumps available for operation, it was limited to operating three pumps. And I'll get more into this operational challenge shortly. I will tell you that the fruit pump station recently went, con underwent control upgrades that allowed the facility to be started remotely from the systems control center. What's important about that is that uh, we learned out of observations from the July 2016 rain event that this control change would allow us to place pumps online as quickly as possible. And it certainly did that. However, it is standard practice for systems control operators to place pumps online three to four minutes apart to avoid power interruptions during startup because the power demand for these very large pumps is so high. Now, just for some perspective, I mentioned the size of these horsepower uh, motors on the pumps. Uh, basically, those pump motors are equivalent to powering approximately 1,430 homes. And just um, without viewing these pumps and seeing what it takes, it's difficult uh, to have a perspective about them. Now, some of the challenges that we had at Fruit. The Fruit pump station experienced two operational challenges during the rain event. The first challenge was the electrical trips on starting the third pump. We don't know the cause of the trip, but we'll certainly investigate that. Given the wet well levels, the system would have been providing normal service. Should, should have been no consequence for that. The second challenge was the power supply to the station, which was interrupted. At Friday at 6.52 a.m., we were informed uh, that the, the service to the station, our pump station was damaged and out of service. At the time of notification, we thought that we were going to have that corrected, uh, but the issue was not resolved before the rain event. By way of background, uh, the fruit station's electrical configuration is divided into three transformers, and each transformer can carry a load for three pumps. One transformer is serviced by uh, a, a station that is separate from the other. So typical in these, in these stations, what we have is two independent power sources from two independent substations. It's considered good reliability. Uh, one of those lines was out of service. So we really only had service from one substation. And although the pump station has emergency generator on site, it's configured to provide redundancy to only one substation. And that was a substation that was still in service. Now, uh, the other thing to understand is that while we were able to run three pumps on the external feed that was available to us, had we looked at the option of going to the generator, the power generator can only support two pumps. So we were using the maximum capacity available and that was achieved and it was sustained. Now I'm gonna move on to operations at the Connor Creek pump station. You know, as the flow from the rain event began to enter the Connors Creek pump station, the levels in the wet well, which indicate the levels in the system, it increased very rapidly. Uh, when I look at the curve, it's almost straight up. The system literally rose nine feet in less than 25 minutes. And additionally, this storm has a complex vacuum priming system that takes approximately five to six minutes to start an individual pump, and then they have to be sequenced. And the wet well much reached much reach 68 feet before we can start the first pump. Again, you have to have the head available for the pump. So systems control in coordination with the Connor Creek CSO Basin team started the first pump at 1236 AM on Saturday after levels exceeded 68 feet and then a second pump at 1244 AM. Shortly thereafter, the pump station lost what we call house power, building lights, access gates, the control system, et cetera. So an electrician assigned to the Connor Creek pump station during the storm had assisted on site at Frood to make sure those pumps were going to function correctly given the issues we were having there. And they returned to Connor when this occurred. Upon arrival, the electrician confirmed that the first and second pumps were operational and that the circuit breaker was reset for the house and then reset the circuit breaker for the house power. After the breaker reset, then the third pump, third pump went online at 1.41 a.m., the fourth at 1.44, and the fifth pump at 1.53. We did make an attempt, systems control attempted to bring the sixth pump online, but multiple faults were experienced. Of course, at that point, 
we were concerned with disrupting the five pumps that were running, and so systems control stopped after making those three attempts. So as with Frood, the Connor Creek pump station faced operational challenges. But I want to reiterate, the pump station never failed. The Connor Creek pump station experienced a house powder out, uh, outage from a leaking vacuum priming pump that sprayed water on the circuit breaker within the pump station. Again, this did not impact the power to the first and second pumps. However, it did delay the start of the remaining pumps. Additionally, as I previously indicated, systems control attempted to start the sixth pump. However, after three attempts, uh, did not want to uh, cause a potential disruption in the other pumps that were running. Now, over the last several years, GWA has been evaluating options for improvements of both Brood and Connors. We have invested more than 10 million in design, construction, and improvements to these stations in recent years. Most importantly, we have initiated design and begun property acquisition for a significant upgrade to both stations. The large upgrade project concept was evaluated in collaboration with our member partners. Specifically, Detroit and Wayne County technical representatives were deeply involved in developing the concept and working through a value engineering phase of the project. The design of the fruit upgrades will be complete this year and we expect to be out for bid for construction next year. As for Connors, we are still in design working through some options but have determined that we will build entirely new sanitary and storm pumping stations. The cost estimate for the improvements to both pump stations is $250 million. And we anticipate it taking us another eight years to complete construction. Because the project is currently in the design phase, we can and will use our observations from this rain event and its impact on the pump stations to reassess the proposed design and consider potential performance enhancements. You know, there have been some questions raised about the level of staffing at these two pump stations, and I want to address that. The Connor Creek pump station was staffed. In anticipation of the one and a half inches of rain that was predicted, we had an operator, an electrician, and a maintenance technician available on site. That staffing level was based on those predicted weather conditions, which we now know were several inches off that, that uh, rainfall total. However, the fruit pump station is operated remotely. Given the close proximity, literally five minutes between the two pump stations, the Connor Creek pump station onsite team members can address an operational issue at the fruit pump station, and that's what occurred during the rain event. When systems control detected a pump trip at the fruit station, the Connor Creek pump station electrician was dispatched to the fruit station. It took him three minutes to get from Connor Creek to fruit. When the house power outage occurred at Connor Creek, it took 15 minutes to run to Connor Creek due to the street flooding that uh, was occurring. You know, as a technical organization, we rely on hard data. And what I've described above are our initial observations and they don't represent exact cause and effect. For this, we will conduct a thorough internal investigation as we do after any major impact. And given the magnitude of the event and the public interest regarding this impact, we have also recommended to our board of directors that they consider retaining an independent engineering expert to examine the system's performance and our response. We believe that having the board use an independent expert will help to ensure public faith in the transparency of the process and ultimately in its results and recommendations. And having provided you with an operational update, I wanted to address a few final points. First, infrastructure across this country is in need of major upgrades overall. But within that process, we must look at our options to be resilient in the face of these weather pattern changes. I believe we can't lose sight of the long view, which is the fact that climate change is having a significant impact on the increased number and intensity of these major storms, which are overwhelming our current infrastructure, as well as that of cities across the country. Now, as a regional authority, we have the unique ability to pivot our attention to look at both our short-term demands, like we have seen this week, but also how do we best prepare in the long term particularly in working with our member partner communities who have also made significant investments uh, to this end. We've seen the emphasis at the local, regional and national level. In Southeast Michigan, we need to continue to work together across county lines as one water system to address the most urgent needs to protect public health and property. And now I'll open it for questions. Michelle, can you please assist me with that? Yes, Sue, thank you. Uh, and just to be clear, we'll take questions from the media representatives present. Um, the first person who has their hand up is Jim Kirstner from TV7. Jim? 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Sue, um, I'm, I'm having a little difficult uh, time. You say that uh, you face challenges with Connor Creek uh, and the uh, other facility, the fruit pump, but you say nothing failed. And then you talk about how you're going to be doing $250 million in improvements and investments over the next several years. So if everything was operating in a perfect world, uh, you, you're, you're indicating there were challenges. Uh, let me reframe the question this way. You're indicating there were challenges, but no failure. So did everything work perfectly last uh, weekend? Well, of course, absolutely not. What I indicated was that we were able to operate under the challenging circumstances we were able to operate um, as well as could be done under the challenging circumstances. And certainly we acknowledge the fact that we had, we were single-ended basically with one feed at fruit, limited the, our ability to access pumps. So, well, in normal circumstances, in this type of an event, we should have been able to have six pumps online. We were only able to have three, but that's all we were able to do. And it was an external effect that we did not control. Uh, at uh, Connor Creek Station, it was a delay. Uh, what I'm trying to dispel is there's an impression out there that the Connor Creek Station failed, that the station did not operate. And that's what I'm saying, that's not true. We were able to have two pumps on at all times. We were able to get five pumps on uh, during the duration of the storm. Uh, you know, what is difficult to, for us to say is given the delays because of the house uh, power issue and wanting to make sure we wouldn't trip the two pumps that were running offline, we had some staged uh, uh, analysis we wanted to do. And so there was delay in starting those other three pumps. But given the way that the rain event and given how quickly the wet well levels came up, what I can't answer is the question of had we been able to do that in the normal course of events without the house power issue, what would the result of that been? Because the rainfall intensity was so large, even giving the phased installation of the pumps, I don't know what that impact would have been. And we won't know that until we do the after event analysis. So by way of follow-up, um, given the challenges that you had and, and an analogy keeps coming into my head when you say you're only able to run three out of the six pumps. Uh, analogy that comes to mind is this would be like a six cylinder engine only functioning on three cylinders. So you're at half of the capacity that you would otherwise have if the engine were functioning at, at full strength. So is that a proper analogy? And then fold it into that. What are the ramifications of all of this? Do you disagree that these challenges, and you don't want to call them a failure of your system, led to the widespread flooding throughout the Gross Points and the east side of Detroit all the way up to the, to the borderline, as Candace Miller suggested yesterday, where she had to run Chapitan because of the, the domino effect. And I can play you her soundbite uh, if I get the chance and have you respond specifically to her. But I think what everybody's trying to figure out is the bottom line, you don't want to call it a failure. You're calling it challenges. But what were the ramifications of those challenges and why is it not a failure? Well, there's a lot of questions there. And so I'm going to try to take them in, in pieces. Uh, the first thing is, I would not uh, say that the analogy is correct because understand that these pump stations, Fruit and Connor and the CSO Basin, they all kind of function together. So when you say it's a, it's a six cylinder engine functioning on three, I would say that's not accurate because Fruit and Connor together between the five and the three, we had eight pumps available to us and they're not all the same capacity, but we had eight pumps available to us when our hope would be that with everything working well and having all the power we needed, we would have been in a position to run 12. So it's eight out of 12, not three out of six. Uh, so, so, but, but it is true. We didn't, we weren't able to run everything that in a perfect world we would have been able to run. That, that, that's very true. What I can't speculate on is what impact that had. And we won't know that because of how, because of all of the differentials here that we have to consider how quickly that rain occurred, a thousand year storm, uh, the sudden rise in the system, uh, the fact that this is a combined sewer system, we know that we get a lot of water really quickly that combines into the sewer system because of the rainwater. So 
understanding that the pumps can only come on in stages every so many minutes and et cetera. Could we have kept up with the rain? I can't answer that. That's what the after event analysis will provide us. I wish I could have an answer for you, but I, I can't. I, it would be 100% speculation. And as a technical person, I, I can't do that. Okay. okay. I, I, Jim, I, we have to go to the next person. I, we'll come back I, I would like an opportunity at the end then for follow-up questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the next person who has their hand up is Joe Gillian from the Free Press. I'm sorry if I butchered that, Joe. No problem. Um, I had a question about Connor Creek. Um, so, Sue, so if you could describe some of the upgrades to Connor Creek that were implemented after the 2014 flood and also um, why isn't there like a battery backup system there for a power source in the case of the failure that you experienced? Thanks. Uh, so let me take the, the issue. If you're talking about a generator backup at Connor Creek, the first thing I would say is generator backup is usually to back up the external power source. We don't know at this point that there were any issues with the external power source for Connor Creek. What I described was an internal house power issue. So that the, the, the generators really don't come into play at Connor Creek. And with regards to the upgrades that have occurred uh, since the prior event, uh, Naveed or Suzanne, I, I would leave it to you to walk through what has been done. Yes, thank you, Sue. Um, Majority of the improvements that were made to the Connor Creek after the 2016 event was really power reliability, instrumentation controls, um, some reconstruction of some pumps, rebuilds of some pumps, and also some resiliency within the vacuum priming system that helped um, on the startup and commissioning of those pumps. So those were the general improvements that were made on the station during, as a result of the 2016 event. Suzanne, do you have anything to, to add? No, I don't. I, I think uh, Navi covered it very well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next person who had their hand up is Sarah Swick from Michigan Public Radio. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so a couple questions here. Um, I'm still, a, you know, as the, Sue is laying out sort of the chain of events, trying to wrap my head around it, but it sounds like there was a sort of chain reaction, a sort of domino reaction because of problems that had initially occurred with the power supply at Frood that affected Connor Creek that in turn pulled folks away from Connor Creek to address that problem and, you know, then had to. I guess what I'm wondering is you said um, that Frood is, is, is remotely controlled. Um, is that a problem in retrospect? Should there be during weather events like staff on the ground there to, could that have helped um, alleviate some of these issues? Uh, Naveed, would you like to respond to that? I can speak to that, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, so when, when we have stations, so very commonly in, um, in wastewater practices, stations operate remotely um, and they are able to start and commission and typically we dispatch individuals for troubleshooting incidences. And fortunately, because of the Connor pump station and the fruit pump station are within very close vicinity, within five minutes of each other, we staff the Connor pump station just in preparation. So if there are issues at fruit, we're able to dispatch. So the, our operational strategies worked in this situation where there was an issue that we had to dispatch to fruit. Um, and then subsequently, unfortunately, we had um, challenges at Connor that we had to dispatch back. But we did have two electricians available that navigated between the two um, sites and was able to navigate issues. So it is a very common practice for stations to operate remotely and reliably. Okay, I think I, I, this is my last one. It just um, to follow up a little bit. I mean, would you reconsider that in the future? I mean, even if it is considered like common practice, like would you reconsider that in the future possibly? Well, I think this is part of what we hope to see in the after event analysis, whether or not given the situations we had, given the type of storm event we saw, whether or not that is something that uh, we should consider in terms of our staffing model changes. 
Again, in this particular instance, uh, recall that the rain that was predicted was an inch and a half. Uh, and so uh, even the pumps that were available at Connor would, or at Prude, would have been more than sufficient to address an inch and a half of rain, even being single-ended. So, uh, you know, the, it's the multiple contingency analysis is, is basically what we, we call this in a utility environment is double-ended, uh, you know, two feeds to the station, uh, redundancy, we plan for all of that. Uh, and the fact that we have people literally, you know, three minutes away, uh, very good coverage. Would we do something more, uh, particularly until we get additional upgrades done on food? That, that's certainly something that will be a part of the after event analysis. So will we consider it? Certainly. If that's identified as something that we should do, we certainly will consider it. Thank Thanks, you. Um, next, we have Eli Newman from WDET. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on, on some of those post-2016 improvements um, um, th that the utility was making. Um, it's, it sounds like part of the failure that happened, uh, that there was this, the, the vacuum pump was spr what spraying water on, um, on uh, a circuit board. Um, but if the vacuum pump had just been um, relined as part of this post 2016, are, are we, so was, was the pump that was affected one that had just been recently upgraded? Okay, um, so the improvements were kind of a, a, a controls improvement, not necessarily piping improvements. So the, the spraying event that we still need to investigate exactly where it occurred was through the piping network. So although we improved the, the startup and commissioning and the controls of the vacuum priming system and reconstruction, when you have mechanical equipment, failures can occur even after corrections just because they are moving parts of mechanical equipment. So further investigation is being made, but this is part of the improvements that were made. Sure, but, but just, just to clarify, the pump that was affected, though, was one that had just recently gone through some of these, these changes. Correct. Okay, and, 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 and secondly, um, in regards to staffing, uh, you're talking about how engineers were kind of uh, split between these two stations. I'm wondering that over, you know, over the course of the last year, we've seen a lot of uh, positions suspended or, or layoffs happening in regards to you know, pandemic and, and taxes and all of that. I'm wondering is like, what are, what is Glee was like current staffing as it was, you know, pre-pandemic? Are we at current staffing levels or um, did that play a factor in, in what we saw in terms of, of uh, uh, staff being um, spread thin between um, all these different issues that were happening? Well, again, I would go back to say staff was not spread thin. Uh, we intentionally made a decision as to the staffing level that is appropriate for these facilities during rain events, and we were at that staffing level. Now, I, I will say generally, like every organization now, uh, you know, given the COVID environment and during the COVID environment, we've had her turnover in staffing, but we also are on a continuous recruitment path. So. Uh, but, you know, our, our level of staffing overall did not impact the staffing for this event. We had no problems at any of the other pump stations. We had no problems at our water resource recovery facility. The problems that we're talking about are localized to these two pump stations, one related to an external power interruption and one related to a house electrical uh, issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, Perhaps if there had been a second electrician available directly at Fruit, but it's not something that would have been a part of a planning process. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, again, I would say the staffing was was intentionally designed to be adequate for a rain event, and we had that available to us. Sure, sure, sure. I understand that. I, I just want to clarify if what 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 is the current staff of Gliwa as it stands right now in 2021 versus where it was maybe at the beginning of 2020. So Sue, so I think he's asking if we had layoffs. We all we've had no layoffs whatsoever. We laid nobody off during the pandemic. Uh, the operation of these systems is critical to our service levels in Southeast Michigan. Uh, so any uh, differentials in staffing in the numbers uh, would have been related to attrition 
and uh, like every organization having challenges to fill positions, but we, we haven't had any layoffs. And I don't have those numbers uh, directly in front of me, but if you wanna give me two dates to capture, uh, we're happy to post something on that for you. Um, thank you. Uh, the next person with their hand up is Sean Lay from Channel 4. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. This is for Sue. Sue, there's an anecdote out there that gates were locked during this event that may have delayed people getting in. Can you address that? Oh, uh, so in our facilities, we have a couple of different ways that people can access. Uh, the first is we have uh, security systems with card readers and our team members can use a card reader and, an a, and a pad basically to remotely operate the gates. Uh, at Connor Creek, when we had the house power failure, it took that system out. However, our gates also have locks on, uh, literally a lock that you can turn with a key. Uh, at one gate, which would have been a passenger gate uh, with passenger vehicle gate, that particular lock had been recently damaged and not repaired. However, we also have a personnel gate, which is an entirely separate gate that you can walk through that has a similar lock and that was available. So uh, from an access standpoint, uh, the bigger issue for us was really uh, the flooding of the streets. So again, three minutes to get from Connor to Frude, uh, it was more like 15 minutes to get back from Frude to Connor because of the flooding of the streets. But uh, access was not limited by, uh, by the issues that we were having on site. Great. Um, uh, we'll go back, Jim Kurtzner, we'll go back to you since there is no one else with their hand up. Okay. Uh... Can you hear me now? I wasn't yes. sure if I was unmuted. Okay. Um, Sue, I, I don't want to seem like I'm uh, beating the same horse again. Um, people are going to see this and they're going to hear uh, your description uh, in a lot of detail about uh, challenges in the system, but yet you're still saying that there was not a failure. Um, how do you reconcile that? Some people might react to that and say, that's government double speak or that's government talk. If a system isn't running up to 100% with all the challenges you've outlined, that could be deemed a failure. How do you respond to that? Uh, well, certainly there were, there were things that did not operate as we would intended. What I'm trying to dispel is the notion that was out there that the Connor Creek Station was completely offline. That, that is what I have heard back from officials in various communities is that 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 message out there, wherever it came from, made them believe that Connor Creek was totally offline and was not operating. And that's what I'm trying to dispel. I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm not trying to give an impression that everything ran perfectly. All I'm trying to do is correct the record so that people understand the station did not fail. Did we have some failures to be able to operate certain pumps as, as soon as we would have expected to? or have wanted to, yeah, certainly we had that. I'm not trying to evade that at all. Thank you. We have two new people who raised their hands. Christine McDonald from the Detroit News. Thank you. Um, I just had a if infrastructure related question. Could you, could someone give me an idea of what the unresolved uh, like capital need, or I'm not sure how you characterize it. Mm -hmm. It's currently uh, including um, yeah, preventative. I was told in like 2019, it was 1.7 billion over that for the next six years, but I was wondering what it is currently. Uh, so there are a couple of questions there, Christine. Part, okay. of, part of which is, I think, what are we uh, planning in expenditures in capital over the next five years? Uh, uh, I will tell you from a maintenance standpoint, uh, I'm very proud that GLWA has adopted uh, modern asset management practices. We've done a lot of condition assessments to understand the condition of our facilities and we programmed, we've done, we've done short-term repairs on things that we thought were egregious and we are planning long-term repairs uh, for those things that have to be engineered and carefully thought through and constructed as well as you know, planned upgrades. So there's that level and I'll let Suzanne speak to that. Uh, but the wastewater master plan that we did in conjunction with all of our member partners and nearly 100 stakeholders across the region, watershed groups, uh, Eagle representatives, people from the transportation side, a lot of folks who have an interest in this infrastructure and its performance worked with us over 18 months. And our focus was really on how do we 
make sure that you know, we have the system that is reliable and resilient and et cetera. And one of the aspects of resiliency is we have a combined, we have combined sewer systems, many of them throughout the region, particularly in the older communities. We've invested a lot uh, uh, in the uh, GWSD system alone, probably over a billion dollars. We know over a billion dollars, not to mention the investments made in all of the other communities. Part of the issue is if, if you want a system that says, no matter what size rain event, we're not gonna have sewer backups, you gotta separate all those sewers. And that number did get identified in the master plan. I said we put 1.2 billion in so far, just in one community, that number is around $17 billion. So we, we know that the likelihood of that, doing all of that anytime soon is probably unreasonable. These systems can't, none of these local systems can absorb those kinds of, of, of costs, you know, certainly to address these systems that systems across the country are dealing with, particularly with these older combined sewer facilities is gonna require intervention and funding from the federal government uh, and, and state governments as well. So we're all dealing with that. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to say that we have a robust capital improvement plan that looks out first in five years and then in 10 year increments. And I'll, I'll let Suzanne speak to that. Yes, thanks, Sue. Uh, so you're right. So we have a capital improvement program uh, that that plan uh, we update every year. And currently, our plan to spend for the next five years is 1.7 billion. That I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, 1.7 billion in our water and sewer system together. Uh, you could just about double that for the 10-year plan. It's pretty consistent. So you're more like 3.4 billion. So it's a big plan. Uh, next year alone, we're planning uh, $285 million of improvements in our capital improvement plan. Um, so it's it's a well uh, updated current number. Uh, we spend a lot of time making sure those plans are, are well developed and we spend a lot of time with our member partners going through them to make sure regionally uh, we're hitting all the needs of the system. Did you say how much you spent um, last year in capital improvement? You know what, I don't have that right in front okay. of me. Okay, thanks. Can that number. We can get you there, Christina. If you okay, want. thank you. Um, next is Brad Lindbergh from the Gross Point News. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Earlier you mentioned that staffing at Connor Creek was based on a rainfall forecast of one and a half inches, which tells me that staffing is a variable of the anticipated rainfall. What would staffing have been had the forecast been more accurate, six, seven, however many inches? And what difference would that have made, if any? Navid, I'll let you take that. Thanks, Stu. Um, so if the, if the forecast was as large as um, what we experienced, um, I don't anticipate that we would have been able to make much more changes. Um, I will say that um, our facility would have been able to, um, we would have monitored and we would have communicated more on this, on the crude pump station power source issue. However, um, our staffing at, for the station and these events that occurred was kind of consistent with what we would do in larger storms. Again, it, keeping in mind that intensities to the level that we received are beyond the design capacity of our facility. So not much okay. more would be done as GLWA infrastructure. Okay, thank you. I, I should know the answer to this because I wrote about that station opening, but what is the maximum capacity and what was the, the demand that night with the storm? So for the Connor Creek pump station or the fruit pump station, are you asking? Well, both. <laughs> so the so the Connor Creek pump station is fifteen ninety MGD. That's six pumps in operations, and for the okay. fruit pump station is seventeen forty MGD. So that is throughout the day of what their capacities are. Um, unfortunately, this is what the after action will provide us. Is what the actual demand was and that's where Sue was kind of com communicating on that we need to do the after action review to determine what the real demand was and that will give us a better understanding of the system response. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and for um, our 
final question, um, we go back to Joe at the Free Press. Uh, thanks. I was wondering, um, so you mentioned climate change uh, playing a role. Can you be a little more specific about the link there and where, I mean, I've heard that before. I'm just wondering if there's any more details you have about, you know, the cause and effect and what specifically about climate change is causing the uh, flooding. You know, we've often talked in the region uh, for the history of my career uh, in water, we've talked about egregious circumstances as hundred year rainfall events. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, that language always confuses people. It actually makes them mad when you say 100 year rainfall event. Uh, when I was in Ann Arbor, we had a couple of 100 year rainfall events within a relatively short period of time. 100 year rainfall event is a statistic representation uh, of the likelihood. Uh, and here we're talking about a thousand year event. We've never seen anything like this. We've never experienced anything like this. You know, in our, in our sector, we talk about there's always going to be a larger storm. And so no matter what we design for, we can always come up short uh, in terms of addressing the next storm that comes along, because all we have to rely on is the history and maybe some of the reports of climatologists, which is why I go back to the wastewater master plan that was done. If, you know, the question we asked the group and all of our consultants was, how would we make the, the system most resilient, most resilient to protecting everybody that served? most resilient for the environment they were looking to protect, and that was for complete separation. But you understand the price tag associated with that is so unattainable for us to support with local resources. We turned our attention, and we turned our attention to saying, what can we do in the short term? Where's the biggest bang that we can make for our buck? And to make that investment, looking at the region's performance, where's the next best investment to make, and how do we take advantage of all of the infrastructure investment already made, because frankly, we're not just we're not just uh, individual communities with boundaries. We have individual permit boundaries. We have, you know, individual looks at our individual systems. But what we recognize there is we need a regional operating plan. You know, the question that came up about uh, what can the upstream communities do when these major rainfall events basically don't allow them to have capacity downstream to get into the GLWA facilities, they have facilities and ability to relieve too locally, but they don't know yet when they should do that because they can't see necessarily into our system. We're working on that today as we speak, making that visible to our communities so that they can see what's going on in the regional system and can act more quickly to use those reliefs and to use their storage uh, as quickly as possible so that it doesn't exacerbate things downstream. We don't have that capability today, but we know that that's a possibility. And those things as a region we can accomplish together uh, in, and we can accomplish much of that within our resources and within regional periods of time. But to solve this issue across the system, sort of in a once and for all, which is what I hear people asking about, it's a huge investment and we're gonna need to have assistance to do that. So, um... WWJ hasn't been able to get uh, their microphone working, so I have two questions from them. Uh, one is, um, uh, one having one pump off for the short time uh, at Connor Creek, did that cause the flooding we saw? Again, I would go back to, that's been asked, and the answer to that is, we don't know, again, what we know is our observations about what happened during the event and what happened at the stations. The consequences of that are going to have to be a backwards look when we do the assessment after the fact to know because there's a lot of complexity here between the rainfall and how it occurred and the intensity and what pumps were operational at what periods of time. Could, could uh, there have been a, uh, an impact? I'm guessing likely. Could there have been prevention, 100% prevention of the flooding we saw? I don't think in my wildest dreams, these, these, these combined uh, sewer systems were so overwhelmed uh, that I don't know that uh, certainly prevention, 100% prevention, I don't believe was possible. Again, I hate to speculate uh, because we're, you know, we're a data-driven organization, but the answer to some of those questions is going to have to come after the fact uh, when various consultants and others have been able to analyze all of this complex issue uh, that occurred in our region. 
Thank you, Sue. Um, we uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, I will let you know that we will be sending out um, Sue's remarks so that you all have them, as well as uh, a, uh, a handout that details the capital investment that Suzanne, Navid, and um, Sue uh, referenced during uh, our press conference. Uh, and the uh, recording of the press conference will also be up sometime later today. Can I just ask a couple of quick procedural questions before everybody goes? Um, you can have one more question, Jim. How, how, long, how long normally will it take for this after action plan to get the answers that WWJ just uh, uh, asked as well? terms of the ramifications of this and how long would an outside engineering firm investigation also take? Are we talking weeks for the internal, months for an external? Can you give me some kind of a ballpark idea? Uh, Suzanne, do you have a feel for that? Yeah, I would say we're talking months in both cases. Um, couple, couple, three months on, on the internal. I, I, I would hope that we could do it in a couple months. Uh, we have to gather all the data and the modeling is quite intensive, right? So it does take, a, take time. So we'll be able to do our data gathering, you know, in, in weeks, but the, the analysis is going to take, you know, another, I don't know, four to six weeks. So I would ballpark our internal investigation at, at two months. Right. Internal, Thank you. I, you know, I think add, add a month to that, maybe, maybe two, depending on, on, on where they go with that. Thank you, everyone. We do appreciate the time Thanks. and, um, uh, your attendance to uh, understand exactly what happened as far as we know it at this point uh, in the last few days. Thank you.